Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce this morning the Reverend Robbie Hamilton, now, who's going to lead us in worship. Robbie is a friend of Shaw's. He is formerly minister of New Well Wine Church in Airdrie and is now a presbytery clerk in the presbytery, Clyde Presbytery. Um, as I say, he's very highly uh, recommended by Shaw and he's actually one of Shaw's moderator chaplains for his time in office. I'm informed that one of Robbie's main interests is singing, and he enjoys choral singing in choirs, so I'm sure as well as teaching us, leading us, he will also help us with our singing this morning. Welcome to Straven Trinity. No pressure, eh? <laughs> I've never had a round of applause before a service. <laughs> but in fact, I've never had a round of applause after a service either. So um, that's quite a different way to be introduced um, to a congregation. Good morning. Good morning. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is when I normally welcome you, but you're welcoming me this morning. And I've had a, a lovely welcome already, having met the choir and, and other people as I was diving in. I've never had to take two services. Oh my. <laughs> now I know what Shaw's had to do for the last number of years. Yes, Shaw and I are friends. Um, both Shaw and I um, served as probationers in Hamilton Old with Hugh Wiley. We were his two favourites. Shaw's probably told you that. <laughs> and if Shaw ever said that he was a favourite, that's wrong. We were equally, <laughs> equally favourites of Hugh Wiley. So that's how I got to know Shaw and then I became Shaw's deputy clerk on a couple of occasions. So Shaw and I worked together within the former presbytery of, of Hamilton and now along with Robert Allen I'm one of his chaplains. Now that sounds very grand, okay. I'm Shaw's bagman for a week. <laughs> I'm Shaw's bagman. I've got to make sure Robert and I have to make sure his robes are in the right places, his notes are in the right places and various things like that. And I also have to make sure that Shaw doesn't get up to any mischief. <laughs> That's the most challenging part of, of being chaplain to a moderator who is Shaw Patterson. But Shaw um, is, we're, we're so tremendously proud of Shaw, um, as I'm sure you are. I know you're going to miss him. You are going to miss him tremendously because he's been here for such a long time. But he epitomises what it is to be a parish minister, I have to say. Shaw Patterson does. Even though he can be naughty, <laughs> he epitomises parish ministry. And at the moment, in the Church of Scotland, what we need is someone like that as moderator, someone who knows what it is to be a minister, someone who knows what it is to have gone through readjustment in a union. And Shaw knows that. He knows the challenges, as you have known the challenges. And he takes that tremendous experience with him. So that's why we, like you, are tremendously proud of him. But how on earth I'm going to keep him under control? <laughs> Although, I might get my own back. <laughs> there was one time when he was moderator of Presbytery, because I followed him as moderator. He was moderator of Presbytery. I was acting as clerk. I stepped into the church before he did, he put a copy of CH4 in my hood. <laughs> and I had to take a whole service with a, with a musical copy of CH4 tucked into my academic hood. Other stories I can't tell you, but anyway, <laughs> I've got a citation to read to you as well. The Congregation of Straven Trinity is hereby cited to attend for their interests at the meeting of the Presbytery called for the specific purpose of receiving and approving the draft Presbytery Mission Plan on Saturday 27th April 2024 at 9.30 a.m. o'clock at the El St. Andrews Parish Church, The Cross, 43 to 47 Mary Street, Motherwell, and online. They're making sure you know exactly where you're going, don't they? Um, and this meeting of Presbytery, the Presbytery will take up consideration of the report of the Mission Plan Action Group, including the draft Presbytery Mission Plan the congregation is cited to attend for their interest by sending a maximum of three individuals in addition to those who are members of presbytery 
and is entitled to respond to the report through the contribution of one person representing the congregation. Um, signed Brian Kerr, Deputy President Clerk, <laughs> signed on the 1st of April 2024. <laughs> no, it's not, not an April Fool. Um, but you know that you've been through adjustment, there's no change here, but you're still, you still have to be cited so that if you have a comment to make, you have the right to make that comment. So um, that's it duly served this Sunday. The psalmist said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit and out of the mud and the mire and he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand and put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Let us worship God, hymn 173. Sing to God new songs of worship. We come before God in prayer. Let us pray. God, our Father, in your love, you welcome us as your children. Through your care, you have shaped the universe, and with your mercy, you hear our prayers. And so hear us, your children, as we come before you with new songs of worship, with a freshness and new vigour in our praise. Jesus, our risen Master, in our weakness you call us. In our confusion you teach us. In our troubles you offer us that elusive gift of peace. Meet us, your servants, your friends, your co-workers, as we gather together and gather around your word. Spirit of the living God, in the beginning you breathed life. In chaos and darkness you brought renewed hope. In many tongues you spread good news. 
transform us, your people, as we open our minds and hearts to you. And so, God, our one God, loving Father, Son, and Spirit, we come. We come with doubts and fears. We come sometimes in ignorance. And we come every time knowing that we have fallen short. That we have failed you. That we have failed your creation. That we have failed your people in so, so many ways. And so trusting in your love, we turn again to you. Asking for mercy and forgiveness. And seeking that peace to set our troubled hearts at rest and renewing us to be the people you call us to be. And so accept these prayers. Accept our worship. Accept us through your love in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite the children and young people to come down to the front. Come and see me. I know I'm a strange guy. <laughs> if you ask Shaw, he'll tell you that. Okay. So I normally say good morning, boys and girls. I normally say good morning, Mr. Hamlin, but I wouldn't banish you. I'll just say good morning. I'll, I'll treat everybody as the girls and boys this morning, will I? So, and you say good morning, Mr. Hamlin. It's always a bit of fun. So good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Now, I'm a friend of, of Shaw's, who you know very well, um, and once a month, when he's away, I'm going to be coming, I'm getting wheeled in and wheeled back out just to come in and help and, and bring some continuity um, to this. So, so you'll maybe get to know me just a little bit, but um, it's, it's strange, you know, uh, I'll tell you a minute, because it's going to fit into the, the story that I'm going to tell. I'm going to show you something, okay? Um, You ever seen one of these before? Gosh, your eyes are like saucers there. Have you ever? Do you know what this? Do you know what this is? It could be. Well, it could be in the old days in the church, they wouldn't give folk plates. They used to have a thing that they passed around, and you put the money in. Do you remember that? Yo, you're all far too young for that. <laughs> far too young for that. So it could be something like that, but it's not. I'm going to give you a clue, okay? What does it look like? It looks like a big, what? Big stick and a big whistle. It looks like a big whistle. Now, I'm not going to talk to the organist or the choir because that would be, they'll, they'll know because they're experts, aren't you? Do any of you know what this is? It's an organ pipe. I know you see organ pipes and they're all metal or pewter, but there are some very special pipes behind an organ that are used for the bass because not only does the organist's hands move, well, you should watch his feet sometime. He gives it loudly with his feet. <laughs> Do you want to give me a wee note with one of the pedals? See these, that noise? When you hear that noise, it's these kind of wooden pipes that are being used and there's air being pushed all the way through. Now, the reason I've now, there's not an organ in Lanarkshire with one of these missing, just, to, just, to, just for the avoidance of all doubt. I didn't steal this from a church, okay? I didn't steal this from the church. I got this, and you know, you know the antiques place down at the, at the roundabout, what do you call it, Gary and Bridge? I bought it there for £12.50. Because <laughs> I love it. 
So you've got wooden ones, you've got metal ones, you've got ones that sound like a flute. Can we hear a flute? It's a flute. Can we hear a trumpet? No. Oh, oh. <laughs> what kind of place is this? Do you have a horn? Um, no. <laughs> I thought Straven was posh. Um, <laughs> let's have a look. Let's have a look. There's a James horn there, I suppose, but... Um, let's hear the James horn. Right. So you've got all these different sounds. What you have there is like a big band or a big orchestra with all sorts of different sounds. And you can play it very quietly or you can play it very loudly. And it's all because there are literally hundreds of these in that space. That's hard to believe. But there are hundreds of these behind these front pipes, okay? And on its own, it doesn't sound very much, does it? It doesn't sound. <laughs> I knew it was going to be one of those days. I just knew that the minute I get the house this morning. So um, on its own, it doesn't do very much, this organ pipe. But when you put this organ pipe into an organ like this, it's amazing what you can do. It's amazing the sound that you get. And you've heard the sound already in, in our hymn. On its own, it's not much. But together, it can do amazing things and together can make an amazing sound. And that's the same for us as church, because as these organ pipes are all different, all make different sounds, all do different things, all of us are different in this church. And all of us are different in churches across the county, across the world. From the smallest to the tallest, from the youngest to the oldest, we all have a part to play. On our own, we can do so much. But together, we can do amazing, amazing things. As I said, from the youngest to the oldest, from the smallest to the tallest, we can all make our voice known. We can all give our gifts. And together, we can make that amazing sound that offers praise to God, not just in our singing, but also in how we live our lives. How we welcome people who come in these doors on a Sunday morning and what we do in our community round about us as well. And you're also part of something bigger. Not only are you part of the church here, you're part of the church throughout the world. And we're all connected. And I, I, I walked down the corridor there. To, I always like to look at the mug shot. Sorry, the, the photographs of the ministers who have gone before. I always like to. I had to in the area I had to walk down um, from 1995 right down to 1750 and look at all the faces looking at me. And I walked down the corridor. And although I've only ever taken a service here once, and that was when I was a probationer in 19. There's connections. My best man, Tom, is a cousin of Alistair Jessamine's. I don't know Alistair, but a cousin of Alistair Jessamine's. Jim Gregg, the next one I walked past, Jim Gregg in my first church in Irvine was my mentor. And I paid the, the tribute to Jim's funeral. The next one I went down is Mr. Hearn, John Hearn. His wife is my infant headmistress. Oh my. <laughs> Mrs. Hearn. You know, there's these connections that are obvious connections, but there's other connections that are not so obvious, but we're all... We can do our own thing, but we can also do things amazing together. And that's what our story is about today, about Jesus telling the disciples, go out into the world, go out on your own, but also go out together and do things together. And the only thing I him, um, you know, when you, when you go around churches, it's like being a student again, I'm doing, I'm doing supply, I'm going around all the, I was in the same place for 32 years, and then they let me loose. <laughs> and you, you, sometimes you know what people know and then don't know. So we're going to sing a couple of songs 
that you might know, you might have heard in songs of praise, but they're going to sing. And the choir have been singing them beautifully in the hall. So, uh, no pressure, eh? We're going to sing the first one, um, which is just the children's hymn, um, My Jesus, My Saviour. It's number 531 in the hymn book. And it's lovely to see you. You're all very quiet. Will you be as quiet next time I come? No? No, that's fine. Okay, five, three, one. My Jesus, my Savior, love there is none like you. I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord of the earth, let us sing Power and majesty, praise to the King Mountains bow down and the seas will roar At the sound of your name I sing for joy at the work of your hands Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. You're amazing students, absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. And I think the wings now go out. Look forward to seeing you again, and I'll see you after the service. And don't eat all the chocolate. Cilia. Oh, I love Cilia. Cilia, the nice folk, hi. <laughs> Sorry, we'll yeah, go on to the new book. Fancy Josie's We are in Shaw's church. I know, I know, I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> right. Uh, the first reading this morning is from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. That's Acts chapter 3. When Peter saw the people, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why are you surprised at this? And why do you stare at us? Do you think it was by means of our own power or godliness that we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has given divine glory to his servant Jesus. But you handed him over to the authorities, and you rejected him in Pilate's presence even after Pilate had decided to set him free. He was holy and good, but you rejected him. And instead, you asked Pilate to do you the favor of turning loose a murderer. You killed the one who leads to life, but God witnesses to this. It was the power of his name that gave strength to this lame man. What you see and know was done by faith in his name. It was faith in Jesus that has made him well, as you can all see. And now, my brothers, I know that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was due to your ignorance. God announced long ago through all the prophets that his Messiah had to suffer, and he made it come true in this way. Repent then and turn to God so that he will forgive your sins. 
The second reading is from Luke chapter 24. <coughs> Excuse me. It's Luke chapter 24 from verse 36. Jesus appears to his disciples. While the two were telling them this, suddenly the Lord himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were terrified, thinking they were seeing a ghost. But he said to them, Why are you alarmed? Why are these doubts coming up in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet and see that it is myself. Feel me and you will know. For a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. He said this and showed them his hands and his feet. They still could not believe they were so full of joy and wonder. So he asked them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of cooked fish, which he took and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture and said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah must suffer and must rise from death three days later. And in his name, the message about repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witness of these things. We sing 506, All I Once Held Dear. We join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and Redeemer. Amen. I want to take you back to the 1970s. I know you're all a bit young to be, to be doing that. But do you remember a TV program, it was a kind of news program called Nationwide? It was on during the week. I can't remember if it was after the news, wasn't it? I can't quite remember. But anyway, there was one time, I was six, my sister was five, was only 11 months between my sister and I, so we were like twins. But um, she, I was six and she was five. And they showed a picture of a werewolf. At six o'clock, my sister could not sleep for weeks and months. In fact, my single bed had to get moved into the back room. And she wouldn't go to bed unless her big brother was looking after her in the room. What I would have done at six years old if a werewolf had come into the house, I have no idea. (laughs) And you're thinking, there's no such a thing as werewolves. I grew up in soul coats. Let me t- <laughs> That's all I'm saying. But she was terrified. And how often have we, when we were younger, been told stories? Well, that house is haunted, don't go near it. Or if you walk that way, there's the white lady. I think in every area in Scotland, there's a story about somebody called the white lady. Stories of ghosts, of ghouls of haunted houses that, that, that quite often scare the life out of young people. But if you go back to the time of Jesus, that was very real for people. People really believed in ghosts and things that went bump in the night. And they often told stories about ghosts, about, about loved ones coming back to life again and coming to meet them. And that's why when Jesus appeared to the disciples, and we hear it in the Gospel of Luke, they were terrified. They were terrified. Because they really believed in ghosts. They really believed in ghouls. They really believed in things that went bump in the night. And you would have been frightened too. If you had seen your best friend, If you had seen your leader, if you had seen the person who guided you die on a cross, and yes, you heard he'd come to life again, but actually you saw him physically in front of you, I think you would be terrified too. So just imagine, put yourself into their sandals, and just imagine how they must have felt. And so Jesus For Jesus, these post-resurrection appearances were so, so important. They were key. Because he wanted folk to know that he wasn't a ghost. That he wasn't an apparition. He wasn't a figment of their imaginations. He was real as he is real even now. He wanted to take away their fear. He showed them his hands and his side to to give proof that he was who he said he was. Here are the marks of my crucifixion. And then, what's the first thing he does in that story? He sits and has food with them. He doesn't teach them, he doesn't preach, he doesn't do anything like that. He does something they did very often. He does something that is so, so very ordinary. He sits down and has a meal to demonstrate that what they shared was going to continue. That what they had shared and what they were doing, all of that, was going to continue beyond all of this. They needed a reassurance because they were going to be sent out into the life of the world and given the task of preaching the gospel, of teaching, 
preaching. Jesus, not, not just crucified, but Jesus risen. Jesus alive. They needed that reassurance. And here we have the resurrection people with the new normal. And the new normal is still Jesus in their midst. It's still Jesus enjoying friendship and fellowship with them. It's still Jesus teaching them and preaching. It's still Jesus comforting them. It's still Jesus transforming them from within. That was never, ever going to change. And that was going to continue. The day then might be witnesses not just to folk then and now, but to us here and now. To know that this is not a ghost story. This is not a fairy tale. This is something very real. The resurrection is at the heart of who we are and what we believe. Yes, there's mystery cloaked around it. There's so much we do not understand about it because it doesn't fit into what we understand about the world, about life, about death, and so on and so forth. And that's why Jesus still comes to us and still comes to places where we are and still sits with us and shares and listens and responds and teaches and preaches and sends us out into the life of the world. They were transformed that day. Transformed. Because it wasn't just hearsay. It was based on a real experience of Christ. And we too... If we are open the way in which they became open, if we are open to the possibilities of God with us, then it can be more than hearsay for us. It can be a faith that is foundational to who we are as a church and foundational to us as Christians in our everyday living. Because he still comes to take away our fears as he took away the fears that day. I came to faith when I was, when I was 16, going on 17. It kind of sounds like a song, doesn't it? <laughs> I had lots of questions. The way the disciples had questions. As a teenager, you have lots of questions, don't you, about you, about who you are, what you are, how you are. And then add into that a poem, I shared this with the folk at Chapleton, a poem that we read in school called Your Attention, Please, by Peter Porter. And it was about a nuclear attack on the UK. Now, this is the 1980s. So there was a high chance that there could have been a nuclear war in the 1980s. And the, the broadcast that this poem was based on took two minutes. And the other eight minutes, you were to find a safe place, a bunker. And I'm thinking, there's no safe places in Salkots, <laughs> especially on a Saturday night, but that's a different story. <laughs> but there were no, and I'm thinking, but what if there is a nuclear attack? Am I going to die? Is that going to be the end for me? Is that it? Life snuffed out. At the same time, I was asking these questions. I had nightmares about this. Honestly, I had nightmares about this. I started to go to a scripture union group at school. And I started to recognize that this Jesus that I'd heard about going up in Sunday school, that's a fact is real. And someday I could get to know. And someone who could... Who, who I could share my, my stories, my questions with. And not only Jesus, but also, as I found my way back to church, I found that was a place where I could ask questions too, amongst God's people, together. They helped me find that place 
And so two years ago when I was, I was diagnosed with esophageal cancer and I was given a choice between curative route or the palliative route because it, yeah, the, the, the treatment, not many, they gave me the percentages, you don't want to know the percentages, but they gave me the percentages. What scared me was the process losing my dignity and so on and so forth. But what didn't scare me anymore was the fear of dying. Because I had that promise. I got to know that experience of, of Christ in my life. And that took away the fears. I didn't mean that I didn't have other fears that I had to work through. It's just that experience, not just knowing of him, but actually knowing him in our lives in prayer in, in our worship, in, in, in our daily living. And so that's the great comfort of the post-resurrection. But also it's a great challenge because once we get ourselves bedded into faith, we're then called to take that faith out into the world. Jesus told them they were to be the witnesses, and we are to be the witnesses. Because we know that in our church and churches, in our community and communities, there are so many fears, aren't there? People living in fear about how they're going to feed their children. People in fear about how they're going to cope mentally with a situation. People in fear because they've been, they've been given a diagnosis that, that is so difficult and challenging. And so we have to be a witnesses to, to what we have known. And that what we can learn to hold dear in our relationship with God in and through Jesus Christ. A number of years ago, the church in Elgin, 22 years, and the local amateur dramatics, A-Chaos, as they called them, A-Chaos, that's the local Amdrams in Airdrie, said we'd like to use the sanctuary for a show. I said, it depends what show you do. Because there are some shows that might not be appropriate in, in, in a sanctuary. It depends what you want to do. We want to do Godspell. And when Godspell came out in the early 1970s, it was controversial. It was so, so controversial. Because it portrayed the disciples as traveling entertainers with their leader, Jesus going from community to community, going from marketplace to marketplace. Because the whole message was that, yes, faith is a personal thing. And we see that in that reading in Luke. It was about that personal relationship of, of the risen Christ with his friends and his disciples. But it's also something that we're called to share, not just here, but out in the marketplace. Now, chaos decided to do something quite different. They set it not in the marketplace, but in Bedlam. Now, if you don't know, Bedlam was the name given to, to asylums where people were shoved. They were in the middle of nowhere. It's people that we would recognize had, had were going through mental health illness and so on. But they were put into a place called Bedlam. And it was Bedlam. The noise, the activity, the chaos, the fear, the distress, it's all very real. And so at the beginning of God's spell, we had people who's, who were just so introverted, who were, who were so messed up, who were, who were so challenged in life. And, and this group of entertainers came and brought them out themselves. Brought them out themselves with the power of the gospel, the power of the good news, the power that God loves each and every one of us, that he comes to take away our fears and anxieties and help us through the most difficult of times. So he helps us through the chaotic times as he helped the disciples in that passage. But he helps us so that we can help each other. That we can go into the bedlam in the world around us, and that is when you look at the news. And you consider the food banks and you, and you consider the struggles of so many people that's bedlam out there. 
We've got something to take. And we've got someone to introduce to the life of the world. And that's Jesus himself. Uncle Alec was a minister. In fact, kind of a neighboring. Uncle Alec was in Darville um, for a long time. If you go into Darville on the left-hand side, you'll see McElroy Court. That's him. That's, that's his street. It was named after him. And he always said, Robbie, if you don't have the answers, don't pretend that you do. So going into the world doesn't mean to say that we have all the answers, that we know everything. It's that we do what Jesus does for us. In the words of Jim White, he preached at a sermon, um, it was a Lockerbie memorial, and he was not helped by people standing from a safe distance with, with kind words. We're helped by people who have known darkness, who hold us in that darkness until we see the light again. Jesus held his friends that day in the darkness till they caught a glimpse of the, of the light. He holds us in the dark times until we see the light again. And we are called to hold each other in this place and beyond this place. Not only allow folk to see the light, but to hear the words, peace be with you. And more than ever, this world needs light. And more than ever, this world needs peace. And the peace that we can bring is the peace that is beyond, beyond all understanding. And so, will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Will you care for cruel and kind and never be the same? Will you risk the hostile stare should your life attract or scare? Will you let me answer prayer in you and you in me? Should your life attract or scare? People might not read their Bibles. One person said to me once, they might not read their Bibles, but they'll read you. And they'll understand faith from what they see and what they read. And that when we are faithful to Christ in the gospel and becoming more and more like him, then others can know that peace beyond all understanding. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. One of the things that you really taught Shaw and and I and others, is that when you pray intercessory prayer, don't just ask God to do everything. Recognize that we're praying to ask God to work in us and through us as well. And that's why we're going to sing number 528, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
Approach God, we have heard his word, now we respond to his word. Your offering will be received. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the light of your love shines on, filling the world with light and love and life and eternal peace. As the bewildered disciples pondered the stories of your appearance, you broke through the darkness of fear and doubt with your word of peace. You showed them the appalling marks of the scars. And you opened the minds to understand why you had to defy, die to defeat such evil and death. Increase our understanding, we pray, open our minds and hearts to receive you. And as we offer these gifts to you, open up our lives to the possibility of what you can do in our lives and through our lives. That we will bring that peace beyond all understanding. And so we bring before you those who are struggling in life, who need to know your peace, those struggling with health issues, with recent diagnosis, with the loss of a loved one, with the concern of how to feed their family and how to make ends meet, and how to sort relationships that are broken. We pray for those in our community, within our families, in our circle of friends, and pray that you will keep them in perfect peace and that we might bring something of your peace to them. We pray for a world divided when we think about Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, and all the increased difficulties and challenges in the Middle East. And also the news of what happened in Sydney with the loss of life. For places facing danger. For where there is division. Where folk cannot simply agree, Lord, keep them in that perfect peace. And maybe be their peace as well. And Lord, we ask a particular blessing upon Straven Trinity in Chapleton and Glassford and in Straven itself and the, the communities round about. You'll grant them a vision for the future and a reverence for the past. 
that you will guide them and all of us as we minister to each other and we strive to be that peace. We ask a special blessing upon Shaw and Christine who draw close to a significant year in their lives. Recognising the, the difficulties and challenges and the loss of, of the last few months. Continue to comfort them. Continue to sustain them. Grant them your vision and your grace sufficient for their needs. And above all else, we pray that the church shall be ready for Shaw Patterson. This we ask in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for, for being so kind and so understanding and so helpful and so supportive. And please continue to pray for Shaw and for Christine. It has been a difficult journey for them, as you know, personally. But what an exciting time lies ahead for them and also for the church. It's going to be a great time and it's going to be a time of great blessing. 512, to God be the glory.
Now, dear friends, the service is over, but the worship continues. As you have known peace, go into the world to be that peace in the life of the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore.